Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, today, Anne-Marie is going to present uh, on the fabrication clean rooms and capabilities. Um, the fabrication capability at Tyndall is one of our unique selling products or, or USPs. Um, it's quite unusual to have such an extensive fabrication capability in um, uh, a research or academic research environment. Usually you'll come across uh, institutes which have uh, a lot of strength in, in design and modeling or strength in test and measurements, but the bit in the middle is often missing. And that's why Tyndall can be a, a very attractive um, uh, research project partner with uh, EU and, and other um, organizations. Um, but it is a unique selling point and we are very fortunate that within the organization as a whole, we, we have design, theory, design, and modeling. We've got the fabrication, we've got um, packaging and assembly, and we've got um, uh, system testing and characterization. Uh, so overall, that's, those separate pieces come together in a very compelling um, picture and a very compelling capability. So Anne-Marie will talk about one piece in that jigsaw, which is the fabrication of clean rooms. Um, she's a chemist by background, inorganic or organometallic chemistry. Um, she joined Tyndall in 1995 and she actually worked for uh, the first year in the 3.5 area. Um, working on um, developing etch processes, wet etch processes for uh, copper, of all things. Uh, incidentally, copper is one of the materials that um, is actually toxic to 3.5 devices, funnily enough, but in the research environment it doesn't seem to matter, but from a, a reliability point of view it's, it's a challenge. She then moved into the silicon fab and she looked after the, she was a process engineer responsible for furnacing, which looked after dopant diffusion, oxidation, nitridation, and, and all things related to control of dopants and um, growing uh, layers, oxide layers and so on, on silicon. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Anne-Marie and uh, let her uh, explain to you what we've got. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm going to turn off my video um, purely because um, my Wi-Fi is not usually that good. So you either get to see me and not hear me or hear me and not see me. So um, today we're just going to do all sound and no picture. OK, so um, as Graham has said there, my talk this morning is about the fabrication clean rooms um, and capabilities at Tyndall. So for those of you who are very familiar with Tyndall and the history of the clean rooms, this talk may be a bit boring, but I'm really gearing it towards kind of, I suppose, the newer audience at Tyndall because we've grown so much in the last number of years that I think sometimes we forget that not everybody is as familiar with the clean rooms or fabrication as we used all to be in the older days when we had a smaller group. Um, almost every group was involved in fabrication, um, either from the modeling or the testing or the actual making side of things. So this morning, I just want to give people a flavor of what our clean rooms are like, uh, what they're about, what we do, and maybe, you know, it might inspire some of you to think, well, actually, there's something here for me, and maybe I should be finding out more when hopefully we're all back on the site and you can actually see in the flesh. So you'll see some of my pictures aren't great because I'm drawing them from old stock. Um, obviously, uh, in an ideal world, I'd be in the labs getting the pictures taken. Um, I did actually get a couple taken by Fergal Nolan yesterday morning and sent on to me. Um, but anyway, so just forgive me if some of it isn't ideal. OK, so just to start with, um, my, my, I suppose my formal title is Head of product, Process and Product Development. Um, basically, it means that me and my team look after all of the fabrication, clean room fabrication facilities at Tyndall. So we provide support um, to all of our users. We provide, um, I suppose, process uh, services to those who don't do their own processing. We work on commercial projects. We work on um, funded projects from SFI, EI, EU, uh, industrial projects. So a wide range. And we use the same tool set in the fabs for all of our processes. So if we start off with the very basics of um, what is a clean room. So 
in terms of semiconductor fabrication, what is a clean room? So a clean room for us is a room in which we're controlling the airborne particle level and we control it to a specific limit. And that limit is usually called the class or the classification. So if you've been around for a while, you'll have possibly heard people talking about class 10, class 1000, class 100. And there are many standards that exist. So when we talk about class 10, and class 1000, we're talking about the US federal standard. Um, more and more, the industry is moving towards the use of the ISO terminology. So ISO 4, 5, 6. And only this year when we refurbished our eBeam lab, now all of the documentation that's come into us uses the ISO. So we're no longer being told you've got a class 100 clean room, you've been told you've got a class ISO or you've got an ISO 6 area, an ISO 7 area. But basically it's the same thing, um, you're controlling the airborne particle levels. So how do we do that? So the sketch here on the right of the screen is just um, like a cross section of one of our typical clean rooms. So you've got basically three floors. You have a subfab or a basement. You have the quiet area, which is the clean room, and that's what you see when you look in the windows. And then up above the ceiling, you have another room, which is called a plenum, which is basically a sealed room. Um, and in through that plenum, we feed our clean air. So to get low particle levels, you have to filter the air. And this is done through a series of meshes from the air that's taken in outside. It goes through a number of filter levels. And finally, it's pushed, it's pushed through these fan filter units, which have HEPA filters, so very high efficiency particle removal filters, so that the air that comes down into the clean room where we're working, where we're making our devices, is as particle free as possible. We also push the air in a unidirectional, in a laminar flow, so in a downwards direction into the clean room. So when you work in a clean room at Tyndall, you're working in a very clean area with very clean air. We push huge amounts of air in, into the room. Uh, the air pressure in the room is always higher than the surrounding area. So if you happen to be passing the um, fab door and the door opens, you'll actually feel the air pushing out. And this is to keep the lab's clean because if the air was negative with respect to the outside or equi pressure, then you would get mixing of clean air and dirty air. So essentially that's what we do in terms of getting the clean air in there. Now I've spoke about filtering out particles. So um, if we look at the, the classifications or the levels, you can see here in this box that um, the number of particles per cubic foot of air is what we're measuring. So if you have a class 100 clean room, so that's the first highlighted blue line, you can see that the maximum particles of a half micron in size that you're allowed in a class 100 area is 100 particles. Similarly, if it's a class 10,000 area, you have a maximum number of 10,000 particles. And that's using the US federal standard. So we maintain and or attain and then maintain that classification by are working with the air supply. So the air coming in, how we distribute it, how we filter it. Prior to going into the clean room and anybody who was back, who was here back in, I suppose, 2007, when we started building the Block C clean room, um, when you're involved in designing a clean room or a fabrication area, you sit with the designers and they're asking you all these questions and you're going, oh, I hadn't thought of that, I hadn't thought of that. So it's like, what kind of devices are you going to make? What kind of work are you going to do in there? Because all of those details um, kind of help them to decide what materials they use in the construction of the clean room. So not to bore you on this, but basically everything that goes into making the fabric of the clean room has to be non-shedding. It cannot be a source of particles. So that's why you've got lots of glass, lots of stainless steel, no soft, stair, no, no soft chairs, no timber, no paper. It's a very hard environment because hard surfaces tend to be non-shedding. And then finally, you maintain your controls by the operating procedures. So anyone who accesses the clean room will know all about our operating procedures um, and they're quite onerous. Actually, so why do we worry? I'm sorry, Par I'm pardon? Okay. Okay, so, so for particles, what are particles that I'm talking about? So basically a particle is a tiny piece of anything, 
dust or any other material that isn't visible to the human eye. So to give those of you who maybe aren't working in the labs an idea of what we're talking about. So human hair, uh, the average diameter is 50 microns. Now, strangely enough, um, it actually depends on your hair color, your natural hair color, should I say. So from red is the um, narrowest to dark, which is the thickest. So but anyway, an average is 50 microns. Dust particles, which we all only see obviously in the sunshine because our houses are all so clean, are about 25 microns in diameter. And the particles that we're talking about in the clean room are a half a micron. So much, much smaller than anything that you can see with the human eye. And they have a big impact on your devices or on what we make in the clean room. So the next few slides here, um, just to show you what particles might look like. So we have the first um, here is a spider's web. So this was actually an SEM that was taken or a scanning electron microscope uh, picture, which is a, a very um, high magnification microscope of a silk spider who had spun its web over a device in a fab in Singapore. Um, we have a skin flake. So when we look into the clean room and you see people wearing the suits, the reason for all of the suits and the protection is to eliminate as much as possible or reduce as much as possible the amount of debris that human beings bring into the clean room. And when we look here at the skin flake um, on the bar at the end here, so this is 75 microns, you can see that you would, if this skin flake breaks up, you'll get a lot of half micron particles in the air in the clean room. So you don't want this happening. If we didn't filter the air that comes in, these would be what we'd see. So pollen grains would be quite common if you're not filtering the air. And you can see that they are much, much bigger than the device that they are sitting on. And this is just the tip of a ballpoint pen. So again, if you think I'm bringing my pen into the lab with me, uh, you could be bringing all of these particles in with you as well. Okay, so that was just a bit about particles. And the question now is, how many fabrication clean rooms are there in Tyndall? So at the moment, we have four, okay? So if we look at them, we have on the top left, we have the big clean room in block C. So all of you are very familiar with that clean room. Anyone coming in through the front door sees it. It's eye-catching, um, it's a great selling point, and people love to look in there. And in the last couple of months before we got uh, locked out, you would have seen a lot of activity because we were doing a big upgrade um, to both the clean room and to some of the equipment that's in there. Then, so this is the well-known clean room. Everybody knows about it. But we actually have three others. We have the room with the blue door. This is Tyndall's oldest clean room. It's, um, it was opened in 1992. Um, here on the bottom left, we have Tyndall's training fab, um, which I suppose it was opened properly in uh, 2010, I think. And then on the bottom right, we have our newest clean room. So this is the refurbished E-beam clean room. And I suppose all of the clean rooms um, operate on the same, under the same protocols in terms of keeping them particle free. So we just spoke about that. Um, the work that is done in there or the types of materials that we work on are quite different. So the Block C clean room is used for processing or making devices or working with compound semiconductor substrates and with silicon MEMS. The E-beam lithography lab, the refurbished lab, um, which we're just getting up and running now, is um, on the ground floor of Block A, and that's multi-substrate. So all of the substrates, so whatever your material is, that can be um, processed in the E-beam lab under strict protocols. So the Silicon Fabrication Laboratory there, the oldest lab in 1992 opening, that's a CMOS fab. So that means really it's the highest standard in terms of um, eliminating contamination because CMOS devices are very sensitive. So Graham mentioned there at the start that copper is toxic for um, 3.5 devices. Well, Copper isn't very good for silicon, but gold, um, iron, um, silver, metals that are quite commonly used either as metallization or as dopants in 3.5 are completely toxic to CMOS devices um, and will actually kill the device. 
And then the training fab, um, we're in the middle now, or we're just, I suppose, starting the refurbishment of that area because uh, we need to uh, improve certain elements of it before we can relaunch our training programs later this year or early next year. So in from the time it opened over a period of three to four years where we had a dedicated training engineer, um, we trained over 100 students, PhD students from across Ireland. So they came and did a week-long um, fabrication course. Um, they made a laser. They went through all of the, the different process steps and they tested their laser at the end of it. So we're hoping that we'll be able to relaunch something similar to that um, at the end of this year. So they're the four clean rooms. And then why do we need them? You know, why don't we just make our devices in ordinary labs? It's quite simple, really. It's that your device yield, um, the reliability, the quality of your device can be affected negatively by particles that are smaller than one tenth of your minimum feature size. So for the lay person, that means that basically if you have a very narrow uh, design or a very narrow rail and a, a piece of dust lands on it, that can just stop that rail from functioning. So it's like ending up like a break on your phone line um, or a break in your electrical cord. So by keeping the area that we work in clean, it means our devices are clean. And as we now go um, to smaller and smaller geometries and smaller and smaller dimensions, the cleanliness becomes even more of an issue. And then secondly, what I, I suppose I didn't say about the clean room control is the particles are the big thing, but then we also control um, some of the environmental parameters, mainly the temperature and the relative humidity. So if you lack the temperature control, if you lack the relative humidity control, then you can lose um, your dimension control on your devices. So for example, today, well here anyway, is rotten, it's wet, it's damp. Um, so the relative humidity today would be very high. If we were bringing air in from outside without removing some of that moisture and changing the temperature, we would end up that any wafers that we or any devices or samples that we would pattern today that we wouldn't get the transfer of the image that we'd require. Okay, so th that's a little bit about the clean room. So now we're going to look at some of the fabrication equipment. Now, I, what I didn't want to do today was to put up a list of equipment because it would be long and it would probably be quite tedious. Um, hopefully, um, as a result of one of the um, Tyndall 2025 infrastructure access um, actions, we'll soon be seeing um, a better way of displaying all of our equipment capability at Tyndall. But that's um, a work in progress that somebody else will be telling you about uh, later on. So if I look at fabrication, and what I have here is I've basically tried to come put down all the terms that we work. So we've laser dicing, we've wet etching, we've wafer cleaning, we've wafer bonding, we've sputtering, we've photolithography, we've wafer thinning. And when I started at Tyndall, as Graham said, I'm a chemist. And when I started, um, not so much the first year when I was working in 3.5 because it was copper etching and I knew a lot about copper. Um, but when I moved into the silicon area, in 1996, for the first three months, I thought I was in on another planet because people were talking about all of these different techniques. So I was going, I have no idea what that is and I have no idea what that is. Um, and then they'd talk about different tools. That wasn't so bad because I could actually go in and see the tool. Then they were talking about different materials. So you have silicon, you have indium phosphides, you have gallium nitride, you have SOI, you have germanium, you have algas, you have glass and you have BCB, and you have SU8, and you have ILDs, and you have TIOS. And I actually, it took me quite a while to get used to um, all of the different terminology. So I do try now when new people start or when I'm speaking to um, students or to customers to try not to use the um, abbreviations or the acronyms because it can be quite confusing. But for the purpose of this slide, um, all I really want to show you is that there's I suppose the matrix of information or the matrix of different combinations is absolutely immense um, when you go into the fabrication areas. You can have any of these materials um, or substrates, starting materials, any of the techniques, and then on top of that you have other materials that we 
that we would put down. So, for example, when I talk about sputtering here, we sputter metals. So there could be, you know, 20 different metals. So that's the matrix becomes bigger and bigger. So what I've done is I've tried to um, combine the techniques into, um, I suppose, groups that make sense or at least make sense to me. Okay. So if we look, first of all, at coating. So what do we do with coating? You may have um, a material that's a suspension. So um, you, you may have made a compound, it's suspended in a solvent, and now you want to get a film of it on your, on your sample. How do you do that? You do it usually by spin coating. So across Tyndall, we would have a number of different methods of spinning um, coatings onto wafers. In the clean rooms, um, we would go from everything from tabletop, very small spinners, to something like here on the left. This is one of our newer tools. It's a lab cluster in the EBEAM lab. Um, it's a series of spinning units, um, hot plates for baking. Um, we, have, we can use solvent-based materials. We can use aqueous-based materials. And that's used for planar substrates. Here on the right is an automated system that really does the same thing as this manual system on the left, except here you can see at the front there's cassettes. So this will take a cassette or a box of wafers. Here the operator individually puts a wafer or a sample onto the spinner. And then in the center we have um, a spray coater. So these two units will allow you to um, coat on planar substrates. The spray coater, which is an, a nice addition to our suite, um, allows us to spray down the sidewalls of very high or very deep structures. And for all of these units, depending on where they are, they can be used for spinning different types of material. So anything that's a liquid that you want to spin to leave a solid layer by annealing. And this would usually be the first step as well in pattern transfer. So what is pattern transfer? Pattern transfer is when you draw your design for your device, um, we then would take that information, or Richard Murphy, who all of you, or a lot of you would have attended Richard's PowerPoint talk a few weeks ago, Richard will take your drawing or your ideas, transfer it into um, a CAD file, which we can send away to external suppliers, to mask makers. They replicate your design in single layers onto glass plates, they come back and then we at Tyndall can use those glass plates in these three systems or systems like these three. Um, so we've got mask aligners, um, which would be for large geometry devices. We have a stepper, which will give us dimensions of about point, or sorry, one micron. And then we've two e-beam lithography systems. So we've our new Eliomics here on the top. That'll be in the new e-beam lab. And we have our Wraith E-Line system down here, which is in the Block C clean room. So I suppose that what the pattern transfer means that we can do direct writing, which means you don't need the mask or the template using the E-beams. And our, our new E-beam will should get us down to um, maybe you know, eight nanometers, which is quite tiny, um, up to our mask aligners, which you can use to print anything really, I suppose, up to hundreds of microns. So that's the range that we can transfer your, your design in. And then we often mix and match. So you might do some layers of your device might be on large geometry and maybe certain layers would be on fine geometry where you would use the E-beam. But pattern transfer is universal across all of the fabs. The techniques may vary. Um, it might be optical lithography. It might be E-beam lithography. It might be different optical lithography tools. But at the end of it, what you get is your idea that you drew on your computer is now being printed onto um, substrate. So then we might want to add other materials. So for example, if you have a conducting layer and you want to put down a second conducting layer, but you don't want them to touch, you need to put an insulator in between those layers. So we could add some dielectrics. So dielectrics might be silicon dioxide, they might be silicon nitride, they might be a polymer material. If they're a polymer material, um, then we'll put them on the wafer or the sample using the that spin coating techniques that we spoke about. Um, if it's going down as a solid layer, um, then we might use some of these techniques. So we have um, plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition. 
So that's PECVD. It's um, a process that typically takes place at about 300 degrees. We have a variety of these systems um, across the clean rooms. Um, some of them can also um, add dopant to your uh, insulator to change the properties of it. So for example, you might have silicon dioxide um, that you want to change the refractive index of. So you might add some boron, you might add some phosphorus, you might want to change the melting point. So you can add those dopants and lower the melting point of your oxide. So um, I suppose dielectric deposition um, is is quite varied and you can change the stress of the layers which people need to do sometimes to compensate for stress in other layers to keep their devices um, planar. And then um, on the right we have um, an e-beam evaporator which can also be used to deposit dielectric layers. Um, the plasmid systems tend to be used for thicker layers and as I said temperatures are about 300 degrees. The e-beam system um, would be much lower temperature so you could use it um, on substrates that are temperature sensitive and the um, dielectric coater, the e-beam dielectric coater is often used for putting down um, optical layers. So if we wanted to add conducting layers, so for example, metals like we spoke about already, we have a suite of equipment that will do that again. Um, so we would have um, sputtering systems or physical uh, vapor deposition systems. Um, these are across the labs. Um, the metals that you can deposit would be, um, okay, so we do copper, aluminium, platinum, um, you can actually use sputtering also to deposit insulator, you can sputter silicon dioxide. Um, we have the temperature of those tends to be either room temperature um, up to 200 degrees, so lower temperature than the PECVD processes. Um, we also then use um, evaporators. So we spoke about e-beam evaporation of dielectrics. Similarly, you can do e-beam evaporation of metals. And we have a number of systems. So um, we have these two here in the 3.5 area. Um, this is new, it's in about two years and quite eye-catching when you, when you pass by. Um, the metal evaporation is, I suppose it's a bit like the dielectric coat or the e-beam evaporation for dielectric coating. You can pretty much evaporate any metal. So we would evaporate gold, platinum, silver, um, chrome, palladium, um, combinations of the same. We've developed um, a process for gold tin evaporation so that that can be used then for um, the eutectic and you can use it for reflowing, solar reflow. Um, so there's a variety of different um, methods of depositing uh, metals or other conducting layers. What I don't have on here is we also have um, a thermal way of doing this. So in a low pressure chemical vapor deposition system or in a furnace, we can deposit layers of um, polysilicon. So we've added layers, we've added patterns. So when you transfer your pattern um, onto your wafer substrate, so we use a layer, it's a temporary layer, so we'd have our mask we transfer the design from the mask into a temporary layer, which is a polymer, so an optical photoresist. And then we use that photo mask um, or photoresist mask to transfer the pattern into your substrate or into your device in a permanent manner. And we can do that really by, I suppose, two methods. So you can either use wet etching, where you use a series of chemicals that are um, tailored to remove the material uh, that you don't want, um, or we can use plasma etching, which is um, basically you form um, a plasma of um, gas ions and you choose the gases um, knowing that they will react with the materials that you're trying to remove. So for example, silicon, silicon dioxide etching would typically be done with fluorine gases because silicon fluoride um, is volatile and can be pumped away. And um, again, across Tindalite, I haven't included all of the images here. These two here in the middle are our two new etchers in the 3.5 area. So they've just been installed at the end of December and we were just getting those up and running before we had to shut down. Um, the yellowy image here is um, 
a wet edge bath. It's yellow because it's located in an area that has yellow light. Um, but we would again have a number of baths across the different labs for doing wet etching of materials. Um, some of the ones that I haven't included then, so we have thermal processing and we have iron implants. So in the silicon CMOS fab in block A, the old fab, that fab is, is different to all of our other labs in that it's um, a full wafer line. And by that I mean it has, we have all the tools in there to make a CMOS device. Um, and that includes um, having 16 furnace tubes and an iron implanter. So Graham said, I suppose, that the fabs are one of the USPs for Tyndall. The CMOS fab, despite its age, is definitely a USP because um, most labs will not have um, the ability to segregate materials to allow them to make a CMOS device. They will not have the ability to add dopants by iron implantation for them to make a CMOS device. So we have um, these in an abundance really, but we only have one iron implanter and we only have one set of furnaces in Tyndall. A lot of the other equipment we have multiples of um, across the labs. Now, I haven't in included all of the processing tools because it's impossible. Um, so I've tried to put them into suites, as I've said. So the last one I have here is um, wafer bonding. So wafer bonding, it's, it tends to be more like, a, I suppose, a back-end technique, really, than um, an actual front-end or working in the lab technique. And at Tyndall, in the Block C clean room, we have two wafer bonders. We have, again, the yellow because we're in the yellow area. We have um, an EVG wafer bonder, and this is used primarily for anodic bonding. So anodic bonding is when you stick or glue a silicon wafer to a glass wafer, to a glass Pyrex wafer, and you form a bond. And this is very useful for making microfluidic devices or pumps where you want to create channels, bond them to an active device so that you can have a reservoir to put a solution through. And here on the left, we have an AML bonder. Um, this is quite old, but has recently been rejuvenated by some work undertaken by um, Paul Hurley's group um, in terms of wafer bonding of semiconductor to semiconductors. And here on the right, we have a wafer cleaner that's only used for wafer bonding because wafer bonding um, is very sensitive to any surface residue or any surface particles. So we have a dedicated wafer cleaner um, that goes with this suite of tools here. So apart from all of the, equip all of the equipment, we have all of the different sizes. Okay, so across the fabs, we would work on wafers of sizes, everything down from um, a half centimeter square die um, up to 200 millimeter wafers. And that's every day in the labs. And that's challenging. It's challenging when you're trying to spec a new piece of equipment. It's challenging when you're working with the equipment. Um, and it's challenging for our users because sometimes the tool isn't set up for what they want it to do. But um, we need to move with the times. And a lot of material now is only available in 200 millimeter. So if we want the best quality material, um, we need to be working on 200 millimeter wafers, or at least accessing them. If we want to work with industry, we need to be able to say, yes, we can work on 200 millimeters. We can develop processes for you. And, you know, we take as much um, care of our students that are working with the half centimeter die as we do of our commercial customers who are trying to develop processes for on 200 millimeter. So, the equipment that I've shown you there, um, I suppose, varies from 1960-ish for one of the sputterers um, up to 2019 for one of our new sputterers. Um, and all of our new equipment can handle 200 millimeter. That doesn't mean we're, we're always working with 200 millimeter. The reality is we are working more often with the half centimeter die three inch and the four inch wafers. Um, and that's what our customers and our users are working with. But we have the capability and we will continue to expand that capability as we go forward to meet all of the needs. And I have to say, it was Richard Murphy who did this slide for me, obviously. Um, 
apart from all the different sizes, you might be saying, why has she got all those different labs? Why is she all those different tools? Should we not be, um, you know, amalgamating them? You know, we're running out of space. The reality is that while the labs all operate um, under similar protocols and while they're all clean rooms, there's very different needs within those labs. So um, over the last couple of years, um, led by Mary White, we've been trying to do a contamination fingerprinting of the tools ac across the different labs. So here I have um, a profile of a silicon friendly tool. So for these, we take a wafer, um, we load it into the tool, and then we take it out, we send it away externally for VPD ICP mass spec. And this particular wafer came out of one of the furnace tubes that I spoke about, one of those 16 tubes in the silicon fab. And the periodic table here, everything that's white, um, the levels are below our, our threshold which is 2 by 10 to the 10 atoms per um, centimeter squared. So on this wafer, the only thing that we detected in that range was boron. Now, most of our wafers, um, test wafers particularly, would be P-type silicon. So they're doped with boron, so they have a small amount of boron incorporated into the silicon. So you would expect to see boron. But overall, it's clean. It's silicon friendly. When we say silicon friendly, we mean the wafer, could go into our silicon CMOS fab and not cause a contamination issue. Now, if we look at the contamination profile of a non-silicon friendly tool, you can see it's a very, very different story. So here we're seeing sodium. Sodium is a real problem for um, a MOS device because it, it will change your threshold voltage. It will keep moving it around. It's not stable. We don't need sodium. Iron is showing up. Now iron, while it's a dopant in indium phosphide, is um, a killer for a silicon device. We're seeing zinc, we're seeing nickel. Um, okay, aluminium is not an issue because we sputter aluminium onto our silicon devices, but we don't want aluminium um, in layers where there should be no aluminium because it's also a P-type dopant. Similarly, if we ended up putting a wafer in here, getting it contaminated with gallium and it going back into a silicon friendly tool, we'd be introducing P-type dopant um, in an uncontrolled fashion. So um, I suppose the segregation um, between the different labs and between the different tools is very much driven by getting the best devices possible for all of our customers. So Graham mentioned earlier about copper being a problem for 3.5. So we wouldn't want to take silicon MEMS devices that have copper and put them through 3.5 tools, potentially adding contaminant that could kill off um, some of the photonics device research work. Um, so that's just to give people an idea of why do we have all of these labs? Why do we have all of these tools? And the question I know that you're all really wanting to find out is, do you have to wear a silly suit to get something made in the fab? And the answer is no, you do not. Okay, so we have many silly suits. Um, many years ago, I remember um, someone whose name I shan't mention was taking their children for a, a tour around Tyndall. And he said to me afterwards that the children's favorite part of the tour was seeing the Oompa Loompas uh, in the lab. So the Oompa Loompas on that particular day were the people in the white suits that work in the CMOS fab. And those of you who are familiar with the Block C clean room will see blue and navy blue Oompa Loompas. And there's a new color coming soon. But basically, if you want to get something made in the fab and you don't want to make it yourself, then you don't have to wear the suit. So we have very many different service and access models. We try to meet all requirements. Um, if we're, we are extremely flexible in our approach. So we would have in the clean rooms um, researchers, we'd have commercial researchers and residents who access the tools, they access the labs, and they carry out, for the most part, all of their own processing. But we also have a team of professional process engineers and process technicians. And my team are available to support our users. So we would carry out tool training. We would offer support in process development. 
But we also um, do all of that work for people whose main purpose is not to make devices. So, for example, you might be someone whose um, area of expertise is in measurement or in test or in assembly, and you don't really want to spend the time or you don't have the time to make the devices. So my team can take that job and with you come together, make a process, produce the device, and then you can go and do your testing or do your assembly and work on the, the part of the process that's critical for you. Um, we also offer mask layout support. So as you know, when Richard gave his talk a few weeks ago and I did the introduction, I mentioned that Richard is in my group and that's what Richard does. So if somebody comes to us and they need a design, it, be it a sketch on a piece of paper or they've already done it on CAD, Richard is there. Richard will take it and translate it into a format that can then be sent out to the mask makers so that we can get back those physical plates and we will then work with you to agree a process or degree a flow that will make your device uh, in the form that you want. And we also have some electrical test support. So a lot of expertise, um, Liam Floyd. So Liam works um, <laughs> across Tyndall with groups. I'm sure many people don't realize he's actually a member of my team um, because he's always there to help students and researchers um, with their test requirements, especially if it's a tricky problem. Liam loves those. So coming towards the end of it, I'm sure you'll all be glad to know. Um, I've taken these slides from uh, other people's presentations um, just to give you an idea of the kind of things that we make. But I would hasten to add that many of the things that are made in the fabs, whether they're made by my team or whether they're made by the uh, lab users, don't end up as a full device. They don't end up in a system. Many people's PhD projects are to develop maybe one part of a process or one component. And it can take many, many years and many, many PhD students before you get to something that ends up looking pretty in a system. But anyway, we'll have a look at, at some of these. So I suppose one of our most famous ones um, is the Tyndall startup InfiniLED um, that were bought by Oculus. And that was, um, I suppose what they bought really was um, the micro LED fabrication technology. So this is Tyndall's role and contribution. Um, this, this work was carried out by Brian Corbett and Plun Mascon's research team. And they would have been supported in some parts of that process by the, um, the fabrication staff in the Block C clean room. And obviously that is a great success story. Um, but again, the amount of work that Brian and Plun and the team would have put in to developing the technology that was eventually licensed to InfiniLED and then sold on would have been many, many years. The first junctionless transistor was made in the uh, Tyndall clean rooms. So this was work with, with Jean-Pierre Collange, who um, spent you know, maybe seven years at Tyndall. And that work was carried out primarily by the um, fabrication team, but um, under Jean-Pierre's guidance. Um, he also had his own research team who, again, as I said, they didn't actually do the fabrication, but they did the design, they did the testing, they fed back into the fabrication team. So we would develop the process or we'd adapt the process um, even better. Um, and on the bottom left here, you can see Tyndall's role and contribution. And this was to make very, very, very fine uh, silicon structures. This is using the old E-beam. So I think this is about 30 nanometers. Um, we'll be able to do much better with our new EB. Um, RADFETs. So RADFETs have been around with Tyndall as long as Tyndall and as long as NMRC were there. Um, again, there were many PhD students, many master's students who developed and worked on the RADFET process uh, with the, the process engineering and the process uh, technician staff. Um, and eventually, and now we have a new startup. Um, so originally this work was done for the European Space Agency um, for radiation dose monitoring. And then through adaptations by the designers and the researchers, um, it's become useful um, in the field of um, 
I suppose, uh, medical applications. Um, so in this particular one here, it was just to measure a radiation dose from um, a radiology um, treatment. And then um, if we move to something different, so inductors on silicon, and this would be work that the fabrication team have done with um, the magnetics team in MNS. Again, uh, I mean, the, I, at this stage, I actually don't know how many years of research has gone into this, but there's probably 15 or 16 years. Um, and eventually, I suppose in the last four years, we've uh, borne you know, great fruit from this because we've had a number of multinational companies um, working with Tyndall, working with the magnetics team um, to bring that into their modern day devices. And then the micro needles is another success story, not so much in terms of a commercial success like some of the others, but most people that you speak to will know about silicon micro needles. So silicon micro needles, um, all of the fabrication work is done in the Tyndall clean rooms. Um, the team then um, in MS often use these um, as um, I suppose molds or templates for to make polymer needles out of them. And we can make solid needles and we can make hollow needles. So wet etching, which, which we spoke about, materials removal, um, will give you solid needles. And then if you add in some plasma etching, you can get the hollow needles. So hopefully that's given you a flavor um, for the clean rooms and the number of them and why we have them at Tyndall. Um, I just get to present here today, but the clean rooms um, wouldn't exist and couldn't function without obviously the staff of, staff of the Process and Product Development Group, the staff of the Tyndall Maintenance Group, because we have a lot of tools, which means you get a lot of failures, a lot of breakdowns, and it's that team who keep those running. Um, the facility staff who provide us with our uh, clean air and our um, environmental controls, uh, amongst other things. Obviously, the, the finance team um, help us along the way with uh, goods in, with our stores, uh, for our invoicing for commercial customers. And the UCC Capital Projects and Procurements team are very supportive and work with us when we're, when we're looking at refurbishing labs, building new labs, getting new equipment in. And obviously, all of our customers, um, including all of our Tyndall customers, without you and without the pushing of you to, for us to do things differently or to us to make different things, um, we wouldn't continue to improve. We wouldn't continue to grow. So thank you for that. Okay, thank thanks very much. Um, Anne-Marie, it's uh, William Scanlon here. Just to, I just put my video on. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the, that um, uh, fantastic um, and very clear walkthrough um, of the important okay. work that you and your team do. Um, and just one, one of the things that we need to add to the, the acknowledgement slide is the support of government um, that set up Absolutely, in yes. the first uh, instance um, and have been refurbishing and, and, um, and reinvesting in, in the tools and equipment. It's all very expensive. It's all very costly to maintain and to, and to keep competitive. So um, well done for the talk. It was an excellent talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Like <laughs> some of the... <laughs> I still suffer from some of the you know, you know, some of the abbreviations, and you have to nod as if you you know you know what people are saying. To you. Yeah. Well, you know I know about wireless communications, but I have to look that one up when I get back to the office. So thank you. I, I also <laughs> want to say that um, the talk today uh, broke our records. So um, you have uh, I think it was ninety seven. I saw it was a maximum, or it could have been ninety eight, um, which is the best attended talk. So well done to you. I'll hand over to you. Yeah, so I'd like to I'd like to add my thanks to that, Anne Marie. Amazing talk. I learned I personally learned so much myself. So thank you very much. And um, several people have been in touch requesting a recording already, and um, that'll be available okay. inter internally. Um, to that won't be available externally, but it'll be available internally to UCC next week. Um, so amazing talk. We, we actually, we have a nice mix of talks coming up for the remaining three weeks in our series. Um, we have one remaining slot uh, before the series ends. So if anyone online is interested in presenting, please get in touch with me. 
So next Tuesday, Philippe Murphy and Zanis uh, Saladuka will be presenting light from highly strange germanium layer directly grown on 3-5 alloys, which kind of ties in nicely with um, some of the stuff you mentioned, Anne-Marie. And then on Thursday, uh, Podrick Morrissey will be presenting uh, photonic packaging and Tyndall and the PIXAP pilot line. Um, so they're next week's uh, Tuesday and Thursday 11 a.m. talks. So um, I'd like to open it up to the floor. Thanks again for the talk. And if anyone has any questions for Anne-Marie, uh, now's the time. Anne-Marie, can I ask a question there? You can. Um, she said nervously. <laughs> the new e beam. The new yes. e beam. Um, is, do you have a list, or or have you worked on the materials that can go into the new e beam, be it metals or uh, types of materials? So we've Brendan has been working um, on different material flows. So we will be able to take all materials. Um, when we set up both the, the, or when we expect for the E-beam and when we expect the coating tools, we've set it up in such a way that we can take what we would call the silicon friendly and the non-silicon friendly. We can take full wafers, we can take pieces. Um, so we should be able to E-beam pattern all the materials. And Marie, uh, Domino here. Um, first of all, thanks for the talk. And um, with the upgrades to the clean rooms, um, yep. what new processes will we add into Tyndall that we don't currently offer? Okay, so in, in some cases, the upgrades will, the increased capability that they will give us is on the, the size of the substrates that we can work with. So at the moment, a lot of the older tools, the largest substrates we can work with are 100 millimeter or four inch wafers. So all of the new tools will give us the ability to go up to 200 millimeter. Then in terms of new technologies, uh, we've um, gotten um, a HF vapor etcher, which will allow us to um, do release work on things like silicon um, nanowires or germanium nanowires um, because the vapor etcher will work by removing um, oxide from underneath those wires and we can have them freestanding. At the moment if we were trying to do that we'd have to use wet chemistry and it, what happens is those little wires which might be eight nanometers um, in diameter they end up sticking to the surface underneath because of the um, the, um, the, the fact that the, the wetting pulls them down and they stick to the surface. So uh, that's a new technology. The new cluster tool, which is the big beast inside in the Block C clean room, um, that's going to allow us to do um, piezo mems in a proper fashion that we'll be able to actually deposit the, the stacks, we'll be able to um, adjust the material properties um, of the piezo mems to meet um, different requirements. And obviously the EBIM itself um, has given us the ability now to pattern much, much smaller features. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Anne-Marie. This is Mircea. I have a question in relation that uh, you say that you like to upgrade the, um, yep. um, the capability to 200 millimeters. How do you plan actually yep. to make the evaluation of material grown on 200 millimeter wafers? Do you have envisaged to have the tools to actually check if uniformity and thickness are um, check across a 200 millimeter wafer or in the future plans? So again, um, when we upgrade our inspection and measurement tools, um, all of the upgraded of the new tools will have to be able to cope with 200 millimeter. So we would have um, invested in some step height measurement systems across the fabs in the last um, two years, they can all take 200 millimeter wafers. We've purchased um, a line with an automated line with measurement system located in the Block C clean room. Um, that can take 200 millimeter wafers and it also, apart from doing line width, it can also be programmed to do some film thickness measurements. Obviously we will 
need to upgrade our ellipsometers and our interferometers as well. And it's a work in progress um, as budget becomes available. But we will have to, um, both in the inspection and measurement side of things and in the way for preparation, the way for cleaning, we're going to have to upgrade to, to have um, 200 millimeter capability. But unfortunately, we can't do it all at once. But it is in the plan. This is great. Thank you. Um, you see that you, okay. you mentioned a lot about fitness and uh, using maybe ellipsometry, but this is not giving the full yeah. information. You need to check the chemistry or the crystalline structure or things like that. There is any yes. future plans to actually address this because this become critical. These are basic equipment which need to be available if we move to 200 millimeter to check the material quality across the wafer. So in terms of um, equipment outside of the fabrication areas, I don't have control of that. Um, if, if there is materials growth that is being done on 200 millimeter wafers, then I am sure the people that are doing that um, will also um, be looking at upgrading that type of equipment.